I believe I have their support because I am an uncompromising Protestant pledged to uphold the principles of the great Protestant Reformation. It is obvious that the Unionist Party is quite prepared to set Catholic against Protestant in this country rather than give the reforms which would in fact mean that there would be an end to sectarianism. Catholics march in one direction, Protestants, accompanied by the blare of martial music, march in the other. When the courses of these two factions collided, the result was civil disorder. This week, Echo looks beyond the parades to the causes of strife in Northern Ireland. Violence like this hit Northern Ireland in 1969 after years of simmering bitterness between the Catholic minority and the ruling Protestant regime. But the problems are not entirely sectarian. Here in Belfast, capital city of the province, unemployment is a major factor in the recent upheaval. Even the dockyards, the largest source of employment in the city, have contracted in the face of foreign competition. And outside Belfast, the situation is worse. In some areas, the unemployment rate runs as high as 20% of the working population. Apart from the dockyards, there is little other heavy industry. Within this unhappy structure, Catholics claim they are the principal victims, accusing the Protestant government of depriving them of work, votes and municipal housing by political and religious discrimination. And while the economic problems are large and long-standing, it is religion above all which divides this land. 1690 is a date which ranks in many ways more important than 1970 within the confused infrastructure of Northern Ireland's religious divisions. In this annual reconstruction of the Battle of the Boyne, the Protestant forces of William, Prince of Orange, later to become King of England, defeat the Catholic army of King James II. Today, that victory is celebrated with fervor by the Protestants of the province as living proof of their right to rule. They have been fighting the same battle for nearly 300 years. The Catholic flag is shot to ribbons, while the Union Jack, symbol of Northern Ireland's union with England, flies everywhere as Protestants prepare for the great Orange Day parades commemorating the Boyne victory. And it's more than a school holiday for the children. Indoctrinated and decked out in the symbols of the faith, they too wait to march. The bands and the banners of the Protestant Orange Lodges wind in day-long procession through the streets of all Northern Ireland cities on Orange Day and Catholics remain out of sight. For years, these parades were harmless enough. But in the heightened political tension of recent times, Catholics increasingly saw them as an affront, a flaunting of Orange Lodges as an organized arm of the Unionist Party government. Catholic opposition and demands for equality began to grow. Under its own banner, the illegal flag of error, the civil rights movement inevitably captured massive support. Civil rights protests against alleged discriminations were regarded at first as no more than a nuisance. But as they continued and became more insistent and extreme, demonstrators began clashing with Ulster's police, the only police force in the United Kingdom which at that time carried sidearms. The clashes remained bloodless during this time, but already the seed of later violence had been sown. Demonstrations broke out like a rash across the face of Northern Ireland. In an attempt to maintain law and order on the streets, the Ulster government reinforced its police force by calling up special reserves 
known as B Specials and Protestant to a man. Catholics reacted violently and the situation worsened. Civil rights degenerated into battles of the crudest kind in Belfast, Londonderry and other towns. In the sway of battle, Catholics and police slugged it out, each accusing the other of throwing the first stone in an unedifying succession of street fights. A great many of the civil rights complaints about boat rigging, inequality of housing and job opportunity, as well as the brutal behaviour of police and B specials, were later supported, at least in part, by an independent inquiry. But the real issues became obscured. The battle engulfed Catholic areas in Belfast and Londonderry, and as the fighting grew more bloody, petrol bombs ominously replaced stones as the main weapons. And into this arena stepped two champions with diametrically opposed views. Bernadette Devlin, aged 21, a civil rights campaigner and Catholic, became the darling of the movement. Within a year, she became Britain's youngest member of parliament. On the other side, the Reverend Ian Paisley thundered anti-Catholic rhetoric to such good effect that he too became a British member of parliament. And as the violence moved into a new and more vicious phase, their voices became the battle cries of two factions now embroiled in a bitter, bloody clash. Oh, God, there's an ulcer at this time. Remove from us the tyrant who would seek to take away our liberty. Be pleased to stir the people of this land. And oh, God, in wrath, remember mercy. And for thy son's sake, give us great victory. If I thought it would bring justice to the people of this country, I would be quite prepared to give my life. The only thing is that in the present situation, because the Unionist Party is not prepared to do anything, quite a few of us may give our lives for nothing. But as always, when politicians speak of victory and the laying down of life, it was the ordinary people who suffered the privations and the loss. The remarkable thing about Northern Ireland was that these people were prepared to go on perpetuating the same battle in the name of religion. Whatever political motives actuated the Ulster government and the civil rights leaders, the fight became basically between men, women and children of the Catholic faith against men, women and children of the Protestant persuasion. In 1969, when it became clear that the Ulster police could no longer contain the violence, the British government stepped in. Troops were sent in force to the province to restore order. On the streets, which had seen the worst of the rioting, they stood as impartial buffers between the two sides. With a nightly curfew, the troops imposed a temporary peace. The brief threat of intervention from ERA, the Irish Republic which constitutes the rest of Ireland, added fresh fuel to the situation for a time. But gradually the barricades behind which the Catholic communities had defended themselves did come down. While Catholic news sheets kept up the pressure, the province itself seemed exhausted by months of rioting. And when Bernadette Devlin was sent to prison for her part in the Londonderry battles, the expected mass demonstrations were on a smaller scale than before. It wasn't my decision. Uh, there's not much I can do about it. The clergy, for their part, made some attempt to reconcile their communities, but peace in Northern Ireland can still only be guaranteed by the presence of troops. There are hopeful signs for the people of the province. Faced with the justifiable claims of the Catholic minority, the Ulster government is committed to reform, including the introduction of universal suffrage and equality in housing and employment, regardless of religion. Furthermore, the B specials, so feared by Catholics, have been disbanded and the police disarmed. It appears that Northern Ireland's suffering has achieved something. It remains to be seen whether all the reforms will be adequately implemented. 
and if the Catholic minority will be satisfied. If so, peace may reign permanently here. If not, then the curse of bigotry and its own history may yet again convulse this land and its oddly devout people.